Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Testosterone Testing, Total, Free, and Bioavailable. I am Kristen perret of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning, made possible by an open educational grant from Agilent Technologies. Agilent Technologies has had no input in the selection of speakers, content, or mode of presentation. Let's get started. You can pose questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the Q&A box, which will open when you click the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Yushin Zhu. Dr. Zhu is Professor and Medical Director of Clinical Chemistry, Co-Director of Automated Testing Laboratory and Pathology Core Reference Laboratory, and Director of Postdoctoral Clinical Chemistry Fellowship Program at Penn State University Hershey Medical Center. Prior to this position, he served as a tenured professor and Medical Director of Clinical Chemistry and Toxicology Director of Postdoctoral Clinical Chemistry Fellowship Program at the Medical University of South Carolina for over 10 years. He is board certified by the American Board of Clinical Chemistry in Clinical Chemistry, Toxicology Chemistry, and Molecular Diagnostics, and a fellow of the National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry since 2007. He served as the president of the North American Chinese Clinical Chemist Association in 2012 president of the Commission on Accreditation in Clinical Chemistry, chair of American Association for Clinical Chemistry Southeast Section in 2015, chair of Clinical Translational Science Division 2015 to 2016, and secretary of Proteomics and Metabolomics Division in 2013 to 2015 of AACC. Currently, he is the board director of ABCC, Treasurer of Mass Spectrometry and Separation Science Division, and serves on Global Laboratory Quality Initiative Asia Pacific Working Group and Mass Spectrometry Conference Organizing Committee of AACC. Yushin is on the ed editorial boards of three medical journals and an invited reviewer of seven international medical journals. He has given many presentations at national and international conferences. He is interested in clinical and translational research in clinical chemistry, toxicology, hemoglobin apathy, pharmacogenetics, proteomics, and clinical application of mass spectrometry. He has over 100 publications, including peer-reviewed reviewed papers, editorials, book chapters, and abstracts. He has received 31 awards from AACC, NACB, and other organizations. Dr. Zhu will now begin his presentation. Good morning. Thank Kristen for your introduction, and thank you all for attending this webinar. Today, I will talk about testosterone testing, total, free, and bioavailable. Slide number two. This is the outline of my talk. First of all, uh, we will briefly review pathophysiology of testosterone. Then I will introduce current methodologies for testosterone analysis. And finally, we will discuss current practice guidelines and recommendations on testosterone testing. Slide three. So what is testosterone? Well, testosterone is a steroid hormone. It is responsible for stimulating development of male secondary sexual characteristics. It is produced primarily in the testes in men. However, it is also produced 
in ovaries in women, as well as adrenal cortex at the lower levels. The function of testosterone in women is not very clear. Slide number four is the structure of testosterone. It is made of four rings, one five carbon rings, and three six carbon rings. It contains a keto and a hydroxy group at the number three and 17 positions, respectively. Slide five. This slide shows the pathway of testosterone biosynthesis. It can be converted from high androstenedio by 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase delta 54 isomerase or 3-beta-HSD. It can also be generated from androstenedio by 17-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase or 17-beta-HSD. Slide number six. Testosterone is metabolized to other active, active steroid hormones, such as estradiol and dihydrotestosterone, as well as inactive or weakly active androstrone and anticholinolin. Slide 7. About 98% of the total testosterone in serum is protein bound, and the 2% is free in both men and women. However, most testosterone in male is weakly bound to albumin, while the majority of testosterone in female is bound to sex hormone binding globulin. Slide 8. Since both albumin bound testosterone and free testosterone are biologically active, they are collectively called bioavailable testosterone. Slide 9. Clinically, testosterone test is used for evaluation of men with possible hypogonadism, such as loss of libido, erectile dysfunction, etc., and women with hirsutism, vasodilation, and oligomenorrhea, all possible testosterone deficiency. In children, it is primarily used for boys with a delayed or precocious puberty, and infants with ambiguous genitalia or vasodilation. Slide 10, for patients on testosterone replacement therapy due to testosterone deficiency or on anti-androgen therapy such as prostate cancer, precocious puberty, idiopathic hirsutism, and male to female transgender. Testosterone testing is useful for therapeutic monitoring. In addition, Testosterone can be used to diagnose androgen secreting tumor. Slide 11. Hypogonadism is also known as testosterone deficiency syndrome. It is a clinical and biochemical syndrome associated with men with advancing aging. Those patients have decreased serum testosterone levels and they may or may not have a decrease in tissue sensitivity to testosterone. Slide 12. Hirsutism is due to increased testosterone levels, causing excessive terminal hair growth in androgen-dependent areas of body in women. Polycystic ovarian syndrome and idiopathic hyperandrogenemia are two common causes of hirsutism. Slide 13. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is a condition in which 
the woman the woman's sex hormones are out of balance. It usually happens among women of reproductive age. They may have infrequent or prolonged menstrual periods or elevated testosterone. This leads to the growth of many small follicles and fail to regularly release eggs. The exact cause of PCOS is unclear. Slide 14. So how to diagnose PCOS? In 2003, the Rotterdam Consensus Conference was held and the Rotterdam criteria were proposed. There are three criteria, including OA, HA, and PCOM. OA means oligo and all anovulation. HA means clinical and all biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism, i.e. increased serum testosterone levels. PCOM stands for polycystic ovarian morphology and exclusion of other etiologies. If two out of three criteria are met, a PCOS diagnosis can be made. Although its fundamental principle is still valid, each of its three items needs to be updated. Another biomarker, the serum antimullerian hormones, ASA, seems increasingly to be an excellent substitute for follicular count and is likely to emerge as the official PCOM marker. Slide 15. Idiopathic hyperandrogenemia is different from PCOS because those women have normal menses, normal morphology of ovaries, but they have increased testosterone levels without other explanations. Okay, uh, I have introduced the pathophysiology of testosterone. Now I will introduce methodologies of testosterone testing, which include radioimmunoassay, immunochemiluminescent assay, GC mass spectrometry, and LC tender mass spectrometry. That's 17. Since radioimmunoassay is not commonly used now, I will not talk more about it. Automated immunochemiluminescent assay is widely used in hospital labs because it's easily available, does not need extraction, operation is easy with quick turnaround time and high throughput. However, compared to other methods, its sensitivity, accuracy, and precision are not sufficient, particularly at the lower testosterone levels. So it is not recommended for women and children. Also, it may have cross reactions with other steroids and there is a significant variability between different platforms. But 18, this mass spectrometry can provide multiple steroid screening in addition to testosterone. Its sensitivity specificity and accuracy are excellent. However, it usually needs more specimen volume and derivatization. Additionally, it is more time consuming and it, it is a method with high complexity. By 19, LC tender mass has become an attractive method due to its high sensitivity specificity, accuracy, and the less specimen volume than GCMS. Although it has limitations including specimen extraction, high complexity, need of special technical expertise, solvent disposal, and the potential matrix effects. Slide 20. 
Due to its popularity now, I will talk more about this method. The first step of LC tandem math is sample preparation. Many methods are available, including protein precipitation, liquid-liquid extraction, supported liquid extraction, and solid phase ex extraction. For example, you can use acetonitrile to precipitate proteins. Many solvents can be used for liquid-liquid extraction. For instance, dichloromethane, ethyl acetate, methyl tate butyl ether, hexane, etc. Supported liquid extraction is to use diatomaceous earth support to immobilize the aqueous sample. Also, many solid phase extraction devices are commercially available, such as columns and plates. You can do either online or offline extraction. Slide 21. Reversed phase columns are preferred for testosterone testing. You could select different particle size and column size. Slide 22. The mobile phase include, include, uh, could be the mobile phase could be water with either methanol or acetonitrile or mixture of these two. Slide 23. Ionization method could be electrospray ionization or atmospheric pressure chemical ionization with either positive or negative mode. The mass to charge ratio of testosterone is 289 and it has two product ions with mass to charge ratios of 97 and 109 respectively. Slide 24. Internal standard could be deuterated testosterone or C13 labeled testosterone. Here are their ion transitions, respectively. Slide 24. This slide shows the chromatogram of testosterone and other steroids in the method developed in our lab. As you can see here, testosterone can be separated from other steroid hormones. Slide 26. Here is the mass spectrum of testosterone and its product ions. The measured mass to charge ratios are 289.2, 109.1, and 97.1, respectively. Slide 27. We use C13 label testosterone as the internal standard. Here shows the mass spectrum of the internal standard and its product ion with, with mass charge ratios of 292.2 and 112.1, respectively. Slide 28. Here is the calibration curve of our method with the analytical measurement range of 2.5 nanogram per deal to 1,600 nanogram per deal. Slide 29. Clinically, we could measure total free and bioavailable testosterone. Next, I will introduce them individually. Slide 30. The measurement of testosterone is relatively easy, less expensive, and widely available. Both the concentration of the total testosterone is affected, but the, the concentration of total testosterone is affected by many factors that changes the amount of sex hormone binding globulin and albumin. 
For example, aging, hypothyroidism, liver and kidney diseases. Also, compared to free and bioavailable testosterone, it is less costly, uh, closely reflect the levels of androgenism in an individual. There is a significant intermethod of variability. Slide 31. To reduce the intermethod variability, CDC has developed a total testosterone standardization program. Testing laboratory will compare their results with the CDC reference laboratory method results to estimate the bias by testing the single unit fresh frozen serum samples. The bias limit is plus minus 6.4%. That 32. Regarding free testosterone, there are several ways to measure it, which include equilibrium dialysis, ultrafiltration, analog analysis, calculation based on sex hormone binding, glottolin, and albumin. 33. You can do indirect or direct equilibrium dialysis to separate free testosterone. Slide 34. This slide shows the process of indirect method. First of all, measure total testosterone in the sample. Then, add a certain amount of radio-labeled testosterone to the sample. A part of a radio-labeled testosterone will bind to the binding proteins. After dialysis, measure the total radioactive, radioactivity and radioactivity in lysate, respectively. Finally, use this equation to calculate free testosterone. Slide 35. Direct method is relatively simple. You do not need a radio label of testosterone. After dialysis, you can directly measure testosterone in dialysate, which represents free testosterone. However, you have to use a very sensitive method to measure it because the concentration is very low. Slide 36. The limitations of equilibrium dialysis include long time for dialysis and a sample dilution. Also, fluctuations of pH and the temperature affect the results. Slide 37. The, the second method is ultrafiltration. This is an ultrafiltration device, and there is a membrane in it. After loading the sample, the device is centrifuged. The free testosterone will pass through the membrane and will be collected in the ultrafiltrate, and the protein-bound testosterone will be retained in sample reservoir. Slide 38. Again, temperature fluctuation has an impact on the filtration. Also, free testosterone, free testosterone may be absorbed to the membrane. Sometimes, proteins may leak from the membrane. Slide 39. Analog immunoassay is a method using a radio-labeled testosterone analog to compete with endogenous free testosterone in serum for a limited number of anti-testosterone antibodies. It is assumed that the analog has little affinity for sex hormone binding globulin and albumin. But this may not be true. So the analytical performance of this method is poor, and the result 
correlate with total but not free testosterone levels. Therefore, this method should not be used due to very limited clinical utility. Slide 40. Free testosterone concentration may be calculated based on sex hormone binding globulin and total testosterone concentrations. Here is one of the equations that have been published. Most of these equations assume that the albumin concentration is fixed at 43 or 40 gram per liter. Slide 41. There are two ways to measure bioavailable testosterone. One is to use 50% ammonia sulfate to precipitate sex hormone binding globulin so that, so that the testosterone bound to this protein is removed and the remaining testosterone is bioavailable. It can also be calculated based on total testosterone and sex hormone binding protein with or without albumin. Here is an example of the equation. Slide 42. Okay, I have introduced different approaches for testosterone testing. The next question is how to select them. Several professional organizations have developed guidelines to address this question. In 2010, the Endocrine Society published a clinical guideline for testosterone therapy in men with androgen deficiency syndromes. It recommends a morning total testosterone testing using a reliable method as the initial test. If it is abnormal, repeat the test to confirm. If a result is close to the lower limit of the reference range, free or bioavailable testosterone should be measured to rule out low sex hormone binding globulin. Slide 43. The Endocrine Society also published a position statement in 2007 about testosterone testing. It states that direct immunoassays cannot accurately measure the low serum testosterone levels in women, children, and men with testosterone deficiency. It recommends using method with extraction and purification before measurement, for example, LC tandem mass spectrometry method. It also recommends calculate the free testosterone as a marker for women with ele elevated total testosterone. Slide 44. In 2015, Canadian Men's Health Foundation published a clinical practice guideline for diagnosis and management of testosterone deficiency syndrome in men. It also recommends total testosterone as the initial test. When a patient has equivocally low total testosterone, bioavailable or free testosterone is recommended. Calculated free or bioavailable testosterone should be used for those men with symptoms and equivocally low te to testosterone levels. Slide 45. It is recommended to measure testosterone between 7 and 11 a.m. For those shift workers, it should be measured within three hours after waking. The testing method should be traceable to internationally recognized standard, standardized reference materials and certified by the CDC standardization program. Okay, uh, slide 46. I have introduced the pathophysiology analysis 
and the clinical guidelines of testosterone testing. Before I complete my talk, I would like to thank my colleagues Chris and Craig, and Chris and Kim for their excellent technical support and for providing the data. Finally, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please ask me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhu, for your presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation. Dr. Zhu will answer as many questions as time permits, and any questions that are not answered will be answered via email after the presentation. For our first question, we have, many hospital labs do not have mass spectrometers. How should they measure testosterone for children and women? Uh, this is a great question. Yes, many clinical labs currently do not have mass spectrometers. We know the immunoassay are not reliable for testosterone testing in children and women. So for those patients, they could send samples to reference labs that use LC tandem mass to measure testosterone. Okay, thank you. Our next question we have is, should deuterated or C13 labeled testosterone be used as internal standard for LC-MS or MSSA for testosterone testing? According to the literature, uh, both deuterated and C13 labeled testosterone can be used as the internal standard for testosterone testing if you use LC tandem mass. Some people may think C13 labeled internal standard is more stable. But clinically, um, both of them can be used. OK, great. Next question. Why are radio immunoassays not commonly used now? Uh, because radio immunoassay is the uh, oldest assay for testosterone testing. Uh, because we have to use radioisotopes, but most of the laboratory uh, try to avoid using, using radioisotopes. Also, uh, most of the immunoassays are labor intensive. That's why it is not commonly used now. Most labs, they use uh, immunochemical illumination assay, automated assay. OK, thank you. Next question, why do different testosterone immunoassays generate variable results? That's a great question. Um, because different companies use different antibodies in their testosterone assays. Also, their calibrators may be different. So if you use different immunoassay that come from different companies, they may give you variable results. So you have to use the reference range provided by the specific vendor to determine your patient's results is normal or abnormal. OK. Next question. Testosterone has two ion transitions, 109 and 97. Which ion should be used as quantifier? Actually, uh, both of them can be used as a quantifier. Uh, both of them have been used. Um, but you can use one as a quantifier and use the other for the qualifier. OK. It looks like we have time for one more question. If a male patient has slightly low testosterone, does this mean the patient has testosterone deficiency? This is a very good question. Um, the patient may, may or may not really have testosterone, uh, testosterone deficiency because this could be caused by decrease in sex hormone binding proteins, binding goblins, and all albumins. To answer your question, you have to measure free or bioavailable testosterone for confirmation. OK, thank you. 
I would like to once again thank Dr. Ju for his presentation, and I would like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today will be addressed by the speaker via email after the presentation. We would like to thank our educational sponsor, Agilent Technologies, for today's webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through January of 2018. Lab Roots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>